So this talk is about time. It's one that I have done before. So when I was preparing the slides, I noticed that the last time that I did this talk was in 2017 at the Clarion Congress Hotel in Prague. So here we are again. What? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> so there's a building in London that has this sign on it. So I thought I'd share that with you. So feel free to interrupt me if you have a question. And I'm going to share a whole bunch of data with you, which is probably going to be different if you try it on your system. Time is what we want most, but what we use worst. And I can prove it. OK, before we get into the open edge part of this, here's just some information that's useful to know, because it tells you how long things take relative to each other. So uh, up at the top, you have uh, CPU-related uh, timings from like reading uh, a block from cache memory in uh, a processor, and uh, a variety of other things down to uh, network traffic, sending a message from California to the Netherlands and back again takes a long time. So you can see kind of what the relative speeds of different kinds of operations are. And it's useful to know that when you're designing stuff. Then we have this chart, which is about I.O., thanks to Tom Bascom, who produced this data many years ago at a, a customer who had an AIX machine. Uh, so, uh, Going from 4GL to the database buffer pool in a self-serving client is fast. And then you've updated a block in the database buffer pool, so it has to get written to the file system cache in the machine. That's slower, but still relatively fast, because you're moving data from user space to system space and uh, making system calls. Then, once it's in the file system cache, it has to get sent to a SAN. And that takes a while. And then the, round, the whole trip from the buffer pool to the SAN cache takes even longer. And then we finally get to the SAN writes to disk. So the whole trip from minus B to disk is what you see here. Um, uh, it's a lot longer than just updating uh, in the 4GL in local memory. So again, it's useful to know the kind of magnitude of these various things. And it also tells you that maybe using a SAM isn't the best idea. That was a high performance SAM. No such thing. <laughs> OK, so in the data I'm going to show you, we're using a test environment where we are uh, we're running the ATM benchmark, and 
in this case, we're not really interested in how many transactions per second we can do. We're interested in how long the transactions take. So our test machine in this case was a uh, HP machine with four quad-core processors, a ton of disk, and we were running 11.7 on CentOS Linux. So the starting baseline configuration that we have is with these database parameters, which is what we always use in these uh, ATM benchmarks as a baseline uh, configuration. And then we can get uh, results for that and make changes afterwards to see are we making things better or worse? Okay, so once we've set that up, then we can run some tests. So we get results like this. The uh, green bar on the left is uh, how long a transaction takes using the uh, baseline configuration. And this, the other green bar, the small one, is after we've done some tuning and made the result as good as we can, then the transaction time is 31 uh, milliseconds. So what we have then is this blue rectangle is 51 milliseconds. What's going on in that 51 milliseconds? Why is... Uh, the bar on the left so much bigger. So, who knows what's going on here? Stuff? Stuff, yeah. Well, the answer is nothing. There's nothing happening for 52 milliseconds. You could be doing useful work in that time, but we're not. So how do we get rid of this nothing? All right, so if we look at what the benchmark does, it executes a transaction that updates three records and creates one. And so it's executing 4GL code. It's reading stuff from the database and reading stuff from the file system cache and reading stuff from disk. Uh, it's creating before image notes for the updates and for the creates. And it's doing the updates and the creates. But it's also creating index entries. And eventually stuff gets written to disk. And then it's using uh, various types of locks in the process of doing all this stuff. So if you look at the locks that are used, there's several different types. There's record locks, there's record get locks, there's the microtransaction lock. There's the transaction end lock. There's locks for uh, data buffers in the buffer pool. There's locks for before image buffers. And there's various kinds of latches that get used in all of these operations. Um, in this particular case, there's no record get locks that are being used because we don't have any fragmented records. So latches are high speed locks that are held for a short amount of time when things are being updated in memory. Because the database keeps a lot of stuff in shared memory which means that all of the servers and self-serving clients that are attached to the database can manipulate that data. 
And so the latches are used to keep things from getting completely mixed up. So only one person at a time can uh, change something. So there's a whole bunch of different latches that are used for different parts of shared memory. And those operations, they might take 100 nanoseconds, sometimes longer, but uh, generally fast to lock and unlock those things. Uh, 200 nanoseconds with a modern CPU is about 480 clock cycles. Maybe, uh, maybe more with a faster processor, but processors aren't a whole lot faster than they were when uh, we did this in 2017. Uh, so they might be twice as fast, but they're not 10 times as fast. You're looking at me funny, Tom. <laughs> That's just his look. I'm not sure what I was doing. <laughs> Neither am I. All right, so there's this thing called lock latency, which is time from when somebody that's holding a lock and they release it, and then the next person who wants to have that lock uh, it gets it. So in between unlocking and locking is latency. How long does it take for the next guy to get the lock? So if you look at an example, there's a lock on the LRU chain in the database buffer pool. So to use that uh, LRU chain, you lock the latch, you do the operation you're going to do, which maybe is uh, moving a block from w in the middle of the chain to the front, as an example. And then when you finish that, so you've updated some uh, linked lists, then you release the LRU latch. So that's what the lock holder is doing. In the meantime, Somebody else who wants to use the LRU chain or update the LRU chain, he tries to get the lock and fails. And then uh, he may try again, but in any case, until the first guy releases the lock, then the second guy can't acquire the lock. So. Uh, when the release happens, then it may take uh, some time for the user number two to notice or to be scheduled by the OS or various other things that could happen. Um, so he's not going to always be able to get the latch right away. So there's latency there. And then in... Uh, Record locks, you have the same thing when somebody's holding a record lock, which is a much longer period of time than what we're talking about here. Um, again, there's the possibility of latency that the next guy doesn't get the record lock right away when the first guy releases it. So the, the latency for record locks could be much higher than it is for these. So the latches are implemented as spin locks. And the way those, are, those work is that you, you go and try to get the lock using what's called a test and set operation. And if that operation fails, you didn't get the lock. And so in the spin case, you try again immediately. Now, that burns some CPU time, so you can't do it forever, because if everybody's burning up all the CPU time, then the guy who's holding the lock doesn't get any cycles to 
finish what he's doing to release it. And in fact, I have crashed systems when I was working on uh, code in the database and did it wrong. Um, and since I was working from home, I couldn't reboot the machine. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so you, you spin and test, so you, you, you try to get the lock a certain number of times, and then you give up to give somebody else a chance to use the processor. So, uh, so you take a nap, and then when the nap is over, you do that uh, same process again, and if it continues to fail, then you take a nap again, but you take a slightly longer one. And then you try again. And eventually, the nap gets longer and longer, but there's a limit so that you don't end up napping for 10 minutes. We're talking here about uh, milliseconds worth of time, not minutes. So if you if you let if the nap time was unbounded, you'd eventually end up uh, sleeping for a long time. So there's a limit to how long uh, the naps take, and then when you reach that limit, they don't increase anymore. So there's three database parameters that controls all this. So if you look at the scenario I just described, you have the white boxes is when you're looping trying to get the lock. The blue box is when you're taking a nap. And then the blue boxes get bigger. So the three parameters, so the dash spin parameter says how many times to try to get the lock before you take a nap. So that establishes a limit on the size of the white boxes. And then the dash nap parameter says what the minimum nap time is. So uh, it's the uh, minimum size of the blue boxes. What well, you don't sleep for uh, shorter times than dash nap. And then as you're cycling, trying to get the lock, nap max establishes the upper limit. So it's the maximum size of the blue boxes. So each of these parameters can be adjusted and uh, changes the behavior. This is an old proverb. And it means correlation is not causation. So when you're tuning things, you got to be careful to be sure that the effects that you see are caused by what you think they're caused by. So if you're changing configuration parameters and you get better performance, is it really because of what you did or is some other effect causing that? So the rooster's not making the sun come up. OK. So if we start tuning the maximum nap time and then measuring the transaction duration, uh, you can see what happens uh, as you shorten the maximum nap time. And uh, the last box on the right there is just for reference. Um, as That's as far as, as low as you can get. So you can see that the varying nap max doesn't have a huge effect, but it has some effect. So you're lowering the transaction duration a bit, so you get down to 75 but not to 33, which is where you want to get to. 
So that's what Dash Spin said at 5,000. Now, let's change Dash Spin to 50,000. What's going to happen then? I got that slide in the wrong place, the one before. Um, so as you as you vary dash nap nap max with uh, spin fifty thousand, you can see that it doesn't have much effect. It has a slight effect, but it's kind of in the margin of error almost. All right, so now let's look at what happens when you tune dash spin. So you keep the others constant and change dash spin. So if you increase dash spin, you're spinning longer, so you're trying more times to get the lock before you sleep. So if you don't use dash spin at all, then the database is using a different locking algorithm altogether and not really doing spin locks. Uh, so you get a, a huge spike. I, if I'd have made that column, scaled it properly for this graph, then all the rest of them would have been tiny boxes at the bottom, so you couldn't tell the difference between them. So, I, I cut it off. So, if you say dash spin one, then you get a big improvement from compared to dash spin zero. Right, yeah, it's 1,000. Uh, and then as you, uh, as you increase it, you get better until you get to a point where if you increase it more, you don't get any improvement. So when you get to 25,000, doubling it to 50 doesn't have any effect. And then doubling it from there to 100 doesn't have any effect either. So there's diminishing returns. So to sum up, uh, if you have longer nap times, then you have higher latch latency. If you have higher spin, you get lower latch latency up to a point. And if you have higher contention for the latch, meaning more users are fighting over it, then you get higher latch latency because you may have to wait for five people before it's your turn. Okay, so next, let's look at maintaining the LRU chain. So the yellow bubbles on the middle here represents the LRU chain. And uh, so whenever you use a database buffer, it gets moved from wherever it is to the front of the chain. And then if it hasn't been used for a while, then other blocks get put in front of that one and put in front of that one and more and more until finally your one that used to be on the front ends up at the end. And then when you're looking for a buffer that you want to use, or a database block that you want to use, and it's not present in the buffer pool, then you have to go read it from disk. And when you go read it from disk, you got to put it somewhere. So we take the oldest uh, buffer on the LRU chain, put the new data in that one, 
and then that one ends up being moved to the front. So you lose whatever was in that uh, oldest buffer. If it's been updated, it gets written to disk first, but then it's not in memory anymore. So if somebody wants that buffer, they got to go get it from disk. Okay, so all these LRU chain operations require locking things and manipulating the chain and updating linked lists and so forth. So the question is, what can we do to reduce the overhead there? So uh, these LRU chain updates, you can think of them as it's just uh, donkey work that gets done, but it's not contributing to getting the transaction uh, completed faster. It's updating the chain in memory, but it doesn't affect the uh, process of the transaction other than to slow it down. So there's this configuration parameter called LRU skips which says, don't update the LRU chain every time somebody wants to do something. Just update it uh, every once in a while. So LRU skips, set, if you set that, it's a numeric parameter that says how many times the chain can be updated, uh, uh, the chain can be used without being updated. So if you set it to five, let's say, that means you can use the LRU chain five times, and then the next time it's going to get updated. So you're eliminating some of the operations on the chain to reduce the overhead. So what happens when we tune that? So we keep nap max constant, spin constant, and we vary LRU skips. And you can see it doesn't have much effect. But that's not always true. That's true for this particular case. But let's look at another example. So what happens? Uh, What happens now if we have dash spin set at 50,000? Well, OK, everything's faster now, so the transactions are quicker. But LRU skip still doesn't have much effect. But if we lower dash nap max to 10 instead of 250, then you can see that uh, LRU skips does have an effect. And uh, in this case, it's not a huge effect, but going from not using it to a small value gives you a noticeable improvement. And uh, if you had a much bigger buffer pool than we do in this example, it would have a bigger effect. So it's worthwhile to set that parameter. And uh, I've forgotten what I was going to say. Uh, so the, the parameter doesn't always have a big effect which is the case in uh, many scenarios where it'll have a big effect for some situations, but not others. So as you're doing the tuning, you've got to be paying attention to what's working, what's not working, what has uh, no effect. And you've got to have scenario, test scenarios that are uh, more than one. So you're not looking at just a single uh, test case.
Oh, so I forgot to mention here. When uh, when you use LRU skips, it's a good idea to turn it on and, and, and use it because the experience that many of us have had is that it often helps quite a bit. So um, I recommend setting it at 100. Um, Tom maybe disagrees because we don't always agree on things. But uh, uh, setting it to a much higher value isn't going to uh, isn't going to help much. The other thing that could happen is if you have a small database with a small buffer pool, then if you set LRU skips to a high value, let's say you set it to 100,000, then the LRU chain is not going to be updated very much at all. So that may cause a big increase in the amount of I.O. you're doing. Because you read a block in the memory, it goes on the back end of the LRU chain when it's read in, but then for subsequent operations, it doesn't get moved to the front. So next time somebody wants to read a different block, it's going to replace the one that we just read, even if it's one that everybody needs to use. So it'll, if that gets replaced, then the next guy has to read it in again. So you get extra I.O. operations if the LRU chain is not being updated. So don't set it to a big number. Yes? I have found that the bigger your buffer pool is, the larger LRU skips needs to be. So most buffer pools that sit around 20 to 40 gigabytes, LRU skips 100 is fine. Yeah. But if your buffer pool goes to 100 gigabytes, if you increase LRU skips from 100 to 1000, you will see better performance because you have more memory so you can skip it more before things get evicted. Yeah. So, good point. But most people don't have 100 gigabytes. They will. <laughs> it's, it's, it's becoming pretty common. Yes. Um, well, I only have 64. <laughs> <laughs> you said it's not 640K. <laughs> Nobody needs more than 640K. I don't know how many of you remember this, but uh, progress used to run in 640K. Okay, so by doing these various tuning operations for the uh, latches, we can get rid of this whole 51 milliseconds of latch latency. Now, <clears throat> what about the other kinds of locks that you have, like record locks? How do you deal with record lock latency? Well, the answer to that is complicated, but the basic uh, the, the thing that you can do is fix your bad code. There's no tuning parameters for record lock operations. So, what do we conclude from all this? So small changes usually have small effects. Sometimes big changes have small effects. Um, tuning spin has pretty big effects. And uh, spin usually should be set higher than we originally thought. Um, and as the processors get faster and faster, higher values uh, become uh, more effective. 
Uh, nap max needs to be low. But if you're going to change it from the default to a much lower value, pay attention to are things working properly or did I just do something that causes lots of CPU cycles to be burned? Because if you, if you make dash spin a big number and nap max a small number, then you're not napping for very long and then you're trying the latch for a longer time. So you're burning more CPU cycles than you would otherwise, or with the default values. Um, and also, these parameters interact with each other. So um, changing one uh, at a time is probably a useful uh, thing. But people get lazy, including me. So sometimes I change three things at the same time. Um, so, for most people, LRU skips of 100 is a good value to set it at. But Mike is right. When you have a very large buffer pool, higher values are good. But it's not a gas pedal. So, setting it to higher and higher values isn't going to make it go faster. There's uh, a limit where once you reach that limit, <coughs> When you should reach that limit, and then nothing uh, nothing changes as you increase it until you get to the point where performance goes down because uh, now you're doing too much I/O. But with 100 gigabyte buffer pool, that's unlikely. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Uh, anybody have questions? No. Yes. So you talked about uh, CPU cycles potentially increasing if you have low net max and high spin. That's going to show up as system CPU time? Uh, no, it'll show up as user CPU time and system CPU time. But mostly user because the spin, the spin is user time. And the, uh, the nap, depending on the operating system, may be user time or system time. But the other thing that happens as you're uh, using these CPU cycles is the operating system eventually is going to say, Okay, you had the CPU long enough, it's time to give somebody else a chance. So you get stopped and somebody else gets scheduled. Well, if that other person who's scheduled wants the same lock that you have and you're stopped so you can't release it, then uh, you could end up in a situation where 100% of the CPU goes to all the people who are trying to get the lock, and the lock holder gets starved. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.